Uh, our next speaker is Terry Bankhauser. Terry is with the Colorado Cattlemen's Association, and his presentation is entitled Living with Nature, Ranchers and Predators. Terry. Well, I must profess I'm not gonna be as eloquent as the good senator. Um, I enjoyed that greatly. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself and the organization I represent, just so you know where I stand um, uh, or where we sit before we stand on issues. I'm, uh, I'm, I've been with the association for 20 years. I came to Colorado from Eastern Kansas, a ranching family, um, a ranching family that worked on uh, conservation efforts, tremendous amount of conservation efforts um, through raising livestock. Uh, the association, um, Rick Snyder, you in the room? Here, here. Rick, you're right down here. Rick knows all these stories that I tell. So uh, Rick will know this one. The Cattlemen's Association in Colorado is 153 years old. So it's been around for a couple of years and that doesn't necessarily entitle us to anything. It's nine years before Colorado was a state. We do have a high level of accountability in our organization um, related to issues we address and the issues that we take on. There's been many of those throughout, throughout history. We represent about 6,000 producers in this state. Um, all of those volunteer for the association on one level or the other and uh, work a great deal on, on a number of issues. Probably some of the most proud issues that we work on do not have anything to do with livestock. Um, they have everything to do with the land and the resources that we are um, challenged with and given the opportunity to steward on an everyday basis. Rick sets on a board of directors for a land trust that the association began almost uh, about 25 years ago, a quarter of a century ago. It was the first land trust in its nation of that type seeking to conserve agricultural land. And why would they do that? Um, was it for the cattle? Was it for the livelihood? Yes. But it was also for Colorado. And Colorado came together and rallied around this land trust to make sure that it was successful in conserving what we felt was really the ability to upcycle um, Colorado's natural resources and conserve them into the future. Some years later, that organization also founded an ecosystem services group that thought that we should focus more on having outcome-based conservation rather than programmatic uh, conservation. For those of you that are around conservation repeatedly, you know what I mean when I say that. Um, that organization worked heavily on a number of species. Um, I myself helped draft the Safe Harbor Agreement and the programmatic approach to reintroducing black-footed ferrets in Colorado. And uh, the reason we did that was is that because that species in some cases was known as the most endangered mammal in North America. And if we could reintroduce that, that species and do it on agriculture land um, with uh, its uh, obligate species, the, uh, um, or it being obligate to things like prairie dogs, we could probably do a number of things. But we had to do them in a way that worked with ranching and worked with Colorado. So we did not do that through a ballot initiative. We did not do that in that fashion. We actually worked in partnership with regulatory agencies to advance that forward. And to this day, I spend time trying to raise money for that program because there is no money in Fish and Wildlife's budget to a large extent to reintroduce those species. And that is one of the challenges that we are concerned about as we look at conserving some of our most natural resources. So where do we stand on wolf reintroduction? It's important to know, and I suspect you already know, where we stand on reintroduction of wolves. And we, we oppose wolf reintroduction. Does that mean we oppose wolves? It does not. It never has. Does it mean that our forefathers and the people that came before us opposed wolves? Probably probably participated in, in some of the activities uh, that were expressed here today. This organization does not do those things and neither does our industry at this point in time. And we, we haven't and we will not continue to do so. We believe species have a right to coexist 
but we also understand ecology, not just biology. We understand that we do have to coexist. And the way to coexist on issues like this is that we have to work toward a mutually agreed upon solution that makes both sides extraordinarily unhappy, <laughs> right? And unfortunately, we're not at that juncture in time. So much of what you expected to maybe hear from me today about how we were going to try to do those things, I'm not able to tell you because I'm caught in the throes of a ballot initiative. And much like any of you that work for an agency or a nonprofit, no that when you are forced to engage in litigious action or ballot initiatives, you're prevented from doing many other things. And that's where we find ourselves because we haven't had that opportunity to have that level of discussion. Um, it, uh, I, it predates me in Colorado. Um, this, our boardroom uh, some 25, 27 years ago um, had a, probably a sentinel meeting uh, related to um, wolf discussions. We had wolves in our boardroom um, of the four-legged variety um, that, uh, that actually were there in an emblematic uh, way to talk about how livestock production and potential wolf repopulation in Colorado could happen. And I don't know that they made a tremendous amount of headway that day, but they did meet and they did have a discussion and they've done so since then. Uh, intermittently, obviously, throughout time, and, and, and probably not at the speed of light that, that some would like to see. What I'm concerned about as we talk about issues of a biological sense, and, and as, as polarizing as wolves can be in my community and other communities, is I'm, I, I become greatly concerned about what that means for other things, what that means for the future of conservation, what that means for the future of the industry that I represent, the people that I represent, being willing to come to tables and in in events like this and have conversations. I get concerned if they are creative enough or motivated enough to start another land trust-like organization that will conserve millions of acres of Colorado land for the future because I know how hard and how difficult it is when we talk about these issues, it is to keep those people at the table. The one thing I know and likely know better than anybody in Colorado, uh, which just dawned on me earlier, is I probably know how many wolves are in Colorado better than anybody else in the state. Anybody care to guess how I know that? Because I represent the people that see those wolves all the time. And they don't call Parks and Wildlife, they don't call the Fish and Wildlife Service, they call me. And I've also come to understand that's probably not an appropriate thing to have happen. We probably need to be very open and transparent about those things and talk about them. And that rests on our shoulders. So as I think about how we move forward and we run this supposed risk uh, that, I, that I'm offering here, of not being able to have additional conversations and activities on things like wolf management. I, I am very concerned about us perpetuating, ultimately, bad management of other species. Because I know inherently that the landowner is a partner in this discussion. By Parks and Wildlife's own figures, we provide 90% of the critical habitat for species in Colorado. By their own calculation. It's on those farms and ranches that that exists. And it's very difficult in my 20 years to get those producers and the people that came before me to get to them to open those gates. And I'm fearful that those gates start to go closed and they will be locked for a generation if we don't take our time with these issues and think carefully. So to me, this is much, as much of a biological issue and an ecological issue as it is a societal issue. I've never been an advocate, even though I spent the majority of my time on public policy, be it in the state legislature or on the ballot, and we deal with multiple ballot issues every year. I have never thought that to be the preferred way to work within a state that I call home. There are better ways of managing issues. Those ways usually involve a kitchen table 
or a boardroom table where a discussion amongst meaningful people um, can happen. And yes, I would be the first to admit that there's often an opportunity and a time for everybody to get a wake up call on these issues. I don't, I'm not gonna show you polling data today. Of course, we've done polling data. We all have done polling data when we do political processes. But I will tell you some of the things Coloradans are concerned about. Coloradans do not support managing their wildlife from the ballot or from the Capitol. They support officers, licensed, accredited, game management agencies and personnel doing that. They know that. They know that that's the best outcome for balance in a state like Colorado, and I do too. They worry tremendously about balance. They don't understand biological systems. They don't understand ecological systems. They simply are individuals that will be bombarded by 20 some ballot measures. Some of them that say, shall the citizens of Colorado be taxed by X percent? One will be saying, shall the citizens of Colorado introduce Wool's West of I-70? Even though the majority of people that vote on this live east of I-70. And I, I worry that as they, as, as we and they and Colorado makes decisions today, what the ramifications of those decisions might be tomorrow. So again, I'll, I'll recall just a, a small sentiment that, uh, and I'm checking my time, about 11 minutes, I believe. Um, I, I think a path forward on, on this discussion and many other discussions of this nature, and we've had our share of those in Colorado, and your, your looks will resonate with me if you remember these, but uh, spring bear hunt, leg hold traps, uh, a number of issues that have made it to the ballot in Colorado over time, some constitutional, some statutory. I often ask myself, were those the best decisions made for Colorado? And those that also failed in many cases, were those the best decisions for Colorado, for Colorado's wildlife populations, for those who try to support species in Colorado? I don't know the answer to that, but I know that changing those measures is something that we cannot do. So the one thing I do know is statutory or constitutional, no wildlife major measure has been changed in Colorado since its passage by the people. Unless the people want to change it, which is a multi-million dollar effort that becomes political and only seeks to make rich those who run campaigns. Our General Assembly in Colorado does not have the fortitude nor the ability, neither do our agencies, to make the adjusting steps necessary to address what the future of wolf reintroduction might look like in Colorado, because they won't do it, even at the detriment of the wolf. So the question becomes, are we too late in this process to make a meaningful decision on behalf of the wolf or on behalf of this issue or on behalf of sportsmen, ranchers, the citizenry in general, which I do believe generally supports wolf reintroduction in Colorado. Are we too far gone to acknowledge that there may be a better way of doing this for Colorado? And if 107 was a wake up call, maybe that's appropriate. But is it appropriate to put something in statute that there will never be the fortitude to change again, regardless of the impact of wolves? So what I'm here for today is, is to not necessarily talk about how ranchers live with wolves, but more importantly to talk about, is Colorado prepared to be responsible with the wolves that either come here naturally of their own accord, or that we place here assuming that they will thrive here. Are we prepared to take on that level of responsibility within the confines of what we're proposing today on the ballot? That's where my concern lies. So with that, I thank you for the opportunity um, and I look forward to ongoing dialogue. I wish we could hit the reset button on some of these issues, but hindsight's always 2020, so we'll move forward. Um, but there is still opportunity. We are not to November of 2020 yet, 
And I think there is a willingness to have that dialogue, um, but it's going to have to come forward in a meaningful fashion. Thank you.